John, can you tell me a little bit more about your organization and what you're doing? Yes. The name of our organization is Disaster Central. And we're, our mission statement largely centers around mitigating loss of life and property around disasters. We've got a couple initiatives going on. We want to been largely concentrating in the States. We want, we want to, you know, expand worldwide with our mission. We've got a theory of change. We have a mission statement. And, and like I said, we just want to disciple that better. And it sounds like a DAO is one way to, to go about doing that. Power, powerful Great. way. In my... Great. John, why don't you start queuing up the frame, the framing question uh, or questions? And okay. we, we will, we're going to focus on you and your questions. And if anyone joins, we're going to welcome them and uh, let you keep going until uh, it feels like time to share the mic. Oh, fantastic. I feel super uh, privileged and lucky, at least for the time being. The first question has to do, we have an idea for a DAO and we were wondering what top level domain extension TLD should be used. Is it? For that, is it dot X, Y, Z? And should the letters D, A, O be included along with the nonprofit name itself? That is probably a good question for your branding team. So that will have a lot to do with marketing and who you want to be speaking to. When you say you're thinking about forming a DAO around your nonprofit, do you want to just give us a little bit more context about what your thoughts are there and what you could accomplish? After some amount of study, we understand a lot of these groups start out on discourse and we have, again, our, our theory of change and we want to advocate for a particular program called Dare to Prepare. Uh, some of the issues we're looking at is, has to do with uh, uh, people with access and functional needs uh, um, are facing uh, what are known as emergency response failures. And so we're looking at some ways we can improve the experience for people with access and functional needs before, during, and after disasters. And so that's one of the programs we're looking at, if that makes any sense. And it, it's in accordance with our theory of change. And shout out if you have any questions on that. We Yeah, Anna's a great resource here too, so I don't want to speak for both of us. I think my first question would be like, what can be accomplished with a DAO that couldn't be accomplished with a regular organization? Because one of the things that we talked about last week is the fact that these are really interesting ways of forming a group of people around like different kinds of governance. And maybe it's that you want it to be really like really egalitarian without anybody in charge. But because you don't have some sort of structure, it can get very disorganized and very noisy with everyone wanting a say on all of the things all of the time. And that can lead to some of its own problems later down the road. So it really depends on what would this afford us that we wouldn't have in a different formation structure. Okay, I'll, I'll address that then. So basically, we... I guess we could look at that as starting out with some ideas with initial proposals, whether we're doing that over discourse or not. We have some definitive ideas that we could put out as an initial proposal for, to be the, the mission or the purpose of the DAO. We get it in a, there's this sort of pure democracy. Maybe that's part of sort of bringing out the ideas and bringing some level of moderation there. But we want to incorporate some of the tools that other DAOs possess, you know, meaning we want to bring in proof of the humanity element to it, because right now there's a lot of undocumented children showing up at the border, southern border of the U.S. that have special needs. And they have no assessments. And one way we're looking, one of the things we're looking at is getting the assessments done or get a program developed so they can be assessed as to what their functional needs are or their disability is. And that is, seems to be a big issue now. 
Um, it is. And it's an important one and one that probably requires a fair amount of privacy when you're dealing with those assessments. Probably, I don't, I don't know that much about special needs education, but maybe there's some, depending on what the diagnosis is, there could be some HIPAA laws to think about. And you've got people coming from other countries. So that I think would probably be best served in more of an organizational structure because you just need to make sure that you are serving those people's privacy before anything else would be my take on it. Anne, what do you think? Yeah, I would, I think I agree with Shannon where the, the most important thing before looking at the tools and what you're going to bring in to make it function is why do you have it in the first place? And when I think about disaster recovery and that kind of thing, if you converted your organization into a DAO, it might be a little bit more agile where different groups of people can spin up different recovery efforts on their own and bring different people towards it or raise money really quickly because you're operating in cryptocurrency, that sort of thing. So I would just be really clear on what it is that you're hoping to achieve with it and how this structure will help you achieve that better before really looking at the tools and that kind of thing. And I would agree. I think proof of humanity is a great starting point for identity. It's probably not going to give you the functionality that you would need for identity management at a traditional border in today's structure, like down the road, probably. Like we're just in the very early phases of decentralized ID. And so I would look at with the IDs that they have today, are they carrying passports? Are they carrying traditional government IDs? And are those IDs a barrier to gaining access or getting treatment or having analyses done on their special needs? Uh, or do they work pretty okay with what they have? And so I, I think those would be the two key things is really just looking at what's the big overarching goal and does the, tru the structure of a DAO support that or hinder it? Yes. And w one of the issues that are showing up unaccompanied often and in the likelihood of them having any documentation whatsoever is pretty slight, but narrowing in on the, the theory of change here would be along the lines of at least get them assessed for special needs. And that way authorities have some level of situational awareness. And so that, that's the thinking on the approach. And as far as proof of humanity, I know it seems to be an early stage effort and we're after some of these, for lack of a better word, I don't know if I'm using the proper terms, but the layer two capabilities where there's the fundraising side of it. And then there's proof of humanity side of it. There's some existing DAOs out there that concentrate on climate activities, climate issues, and that have, you know, some history. And we don't know if we should go with a proposal to some of the existing DAOs because it really does address a broader issue when it has to do with climate refugees and whether we characterize that theory of change with, with our own theory of change, or we collaborate for lack of a better word with an, another DAO or present a proposal to another DAO that's more established. Yeah. Yeah. And it's all really good thinking, John. And I, I would probably just personally really lean on some of the stuff that we talked about last week in terms of the fact that what Anne said about decentralized identity being really, being really new still, and it, it's been untested. You're talking about some people who are still pretty vulnerable, probably best to err on the side of caution before you start testing out these apps on people who don't have resilience and keeping it to traditional systems that we know for now so that you and I can do some more of the testing around the decentralized identity and we can kick the tires because we still have driver's licenses and secu social security numbers and things to fall back on. So probably for now, best to err on the side of tried and, and tested before we start exposing people to these new systems. That makes sense. Here. Could you take the approach of sort of a work group approach with maybe subcategories of dealing with these issues, how would you suggest, would you have any suggestions along those lines as to throttling back on the end in mind, but bringing awareness to these sorts of issues? 
Yeah, I would yeah. say that like the the key difference really between a DAO and a flat organization that has different work groups that work together is really just power. Like where does the power sit? And so in a situation where you have work groups, maybe they're doing the work, but there's one person that manages the bank account or one person that or a group of people on what's happening or has, yeah, maybe they manage the voting software that these groups work on and there's a possibility of hacking. It's the work groups work in a situation where you trust each other really well. So if we're all working, let's say everyone on the Zoom call decide we want to work together to help people who don't have identity. If we all trust each other to work together and we trust that Shannon is going to manage the bank account and we're okay with that, that's really good enough. We can achieve all of our goals with that. But if I don't know, I'm like, hey, I can't see Caitlin's face. I don't know who she is. I don't trust her. So I don't know if she should be managing the bank account. Then maybe we want to create a DAO where we can all have transparent voting and transparent money management systems because it's using cryptocurrency. And so I think I would look at it less about the overall structure because you can have these kind of flat structures anyway, but really look at, do you need the the power structures that a DAO will bring to help eliminate corruption and mistrust within the way you're operating? So I think that's probably the key takeaways of the differences between a traditional work group model. I don't know if you have thoughts or anything to add on that, Shannon. No, well, that I was think great. We're, go ahead. I'm sorry. Continues where we're going to shine in. No, it's good. And maybe okay. we just put a pin in that question for just a second and just check in and see if people have other pressing questions. I, I can't remember. I think maybe Beverly joined next. Billy, do you have Trent? Yes, Beverly's next. Thanks. Hi, Beverly. Did you come today with a question or are you just chatting and listening in? You're muted, dear. Just listening. Okay, great. Thanks for joining. And totally don't need to run the, the floor here. I don't know um, if any of our other members have pressing questions. I don't know if you just want to go ahead and raise hands when you do or put them in the chat or we can just continue to round robin some of the issues that John is is so um, timely bringing to the call. And Caitlin, if you're right. curious yeah. about like how blockchain could apply to your organization, we can just hear about what your organization is up to and maybe come up with some ideas for you of, of projects you could look at. So lots of opportunities to chat. I know Nick CivicQ, that was the blockchain-based voting app from last week, wasn't it? Or or something similar? Nick, I don't know if you want to tell us a bit more about what you're working on. Hey, yeah, sure. Yes. I was I was in one of the the meetings last week or just a couple of days ago. Yes. We recently joined TechSoup. We're pretty new here. What we're doing here in Taiwan here is CivicQ is building a civic media platform as a decentralized autonomous organization owned and managed by all users. Now we do this through three missions. First is we are forging digital democracy with blockchain technology. Okay, that goes without saying. But what we do with this is we have a separate KYC mechanism, more traditional KYC. Basically, we work with a traditional banking system and traditional uh, ex 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 uh, existing uh, telecom service providers to uh, KYC people. Now, second is we defending data ethics with revenue sharing. This is essentially similar to filling out surveys and get paid uh, or watching ads and get paid. Instead of the small tokens that you get paid with, uh, we can pay with fiat currency. And then the uh, percentage of that is much, much higher compared right. to the typical filling out surveys, the stuff. Okay. And the third one is we promote critical thinking with Gamma Learning. So what we're doing here is we essentially treating voting and quizzes are the same thing. They are all multiple choices, except that quizzes don't have correct answers. Whereas voting don't have correct answers, but there are still multiple choices. So essentially what we're doing is we highly encourage people to label themselves with data, tag themselves. Some of the, and some of the questions, some of the questions, they will be analyzed on the questions, some of them, and some of them will be analyzed on the answer choices. 
And for those that they will be answered on the answer choices song, they will be notified. They will be because there's privacy concern, but we are, as they are getting paid for the data that they are giving out. So we think this makes the, makes the, the whole social media operation a little more fair compared to what is going on right now. That's is essentially the nutshell of uh, what we're doing. Very cool. Thank you. Yeah. And again, happy to, to talk to anybody that's here, or we can just continue to bounce ideas around. If RJ or Caitlin or anybody else, if you guys have questions, feel free to pop them in the chat or otherwise stick your hand up. But we were talking with John earlier about sensitive questions when there are kids doing border crossings, when some of them have specific needs. We were talking about decentralized identity and how that can be used among different organizations. It is still a little bit of a tricky thing to accomplish right now when none of this has been tested. John, I don't know, did you have other questions around that? Yes, I did. And this more has to do with, I guess, promotion of the DAO. Has there been a case DAOs have been promoted using Web 2.0 technologies like Google Ads or anything of that nature? And this essentially means showing up in the search engine results for certain favorable keywords, that sort of thing. Has that ever been deployed as a... a One of the things to think about in forming a DAO is that it's not often that you'll see people taking out Google ads specifically because thinking about like Dunbar's number, are you familiar with the kind of thinking around that we can only know so many people and that once we pass a certain size threshold, we lose a lot of social coherence and cohesion. We don't necessarily want 70,000 people in one of our DAOs because now it's so noisy. How do you decide who's voting on what? How do you self-select? Do you have relationship with other people in the organization? So at some point, it's better to have a Twitter following where everyone's following what you're doing and there's a group of people actually doing the actions rather than trying to have tens of thousands of people actively contributing as well. At some point, it just gets too much to manage. I'm sure there are people that have done all sorts of advertising around this kind of thing. But in my experience, less isn't always, like more doesn't always accomplish what you want. Twitter has been a very big part of this because we're still very tech-centric. That's where things like the Constitution DAO that we talked about last week, that's where they got a lot of their momentum. If you're fundraising, Ukraine DAO did a lot of advertising to grab more. Like it was all based on donation. And then a small group of people figured out how to deploy those funds. So in those specific cases, it can be better to have more people involved. But depending on what your goals are, if it has to do with governance of the organization, you're actually going to run into a number where it's harming you to have more and more voices in the room. And Anne probably has great thoughts on this too. Yeah, I would also add, it's, it's also about what type of person that you're hoping to bring into the DAO. So traditionally, DAOs, because they're very tech heavy or, or you at least need to know how to use cryptocurrency to be able to vote and to be able to participate, that a Web2 crowd was not who they were trying to attract. It was really people from the Web3 space. As Shannon mentioned, a lot of the word would get spread on Twitter or they would give presentations at crypto conferences and that kind of thing. So it was really, what are what is the type of person that you're hoping to bring into the DAO? And then where are you going to find those people? And I think if, yeah, if you're looking for a Web2 crowd, you could do Google ads, but then is, is that person going to have the technical knowledge to be able to actually operate within the DAO and perform the functions they need to, to perform using Web3 technologies? If I may, I'd like to segue a little bit into the tokenization aspect. And I know there's generally two types of tokens, a governor's token and a, and a fundraising token. And I'm not exactly clear how that all interplays when, when it comes to having an NFT and, and where the fundraising effort starts or ends, or whether you're, let's say, paying your facilitators or moderators or workers. I don't know if I'm not using the right terms or not, but how does when you decide on the tokenization side of things, and I realize that's way into the future for us, but just so I can get a basic understanding of a typical tokenization scenario and 
as it relates to a nonprofit cause or at least cause with a theory of change. Mm -hmm. And this gets tricky quite quickly, especially in the U.S. in terms of uh, how you even talk about having a token involved. There's a lot of regulatory frameworks that you have to be cautious of here. Just as with any kind of club, you could think of DAOs as a new kind of a club. There's a billion different ways to structure them in terms of, do you want to have one person, one vote? Do you want to have people that have earned more reputation and then they have more leadership voice? Do you want it to be something that they can just buy into like monetarily? Like maybe if it's an investment DAO, the more that I contribute, the louder my voice becomes. Do you want to keep it egalitarian? Do you want to find ways where it's that, that sweat equity can earn your way into more of a voice? Do you have a leadership council? There's ways to do delegate voting so that I'm a member of a DAO, but I don't have to de vote on all of the things because I have delegated my votes to Anne because I trust her in a lot of ways. Uh, I wish I could give you an easy answer on this, but it really does have like there's so many different shades of the rainbow about how you put this together. And do you know of any sort of nonprofit token model? I'm just trying to think most, if you look at some of the most functional DAOs, like Gitcoin, for example, they have a GTC token that essentially they airdropped to all of their previous users. So they started as a company and so they gave anyone who had participated with the organization an airdrop of GTC tokens. And those tokens enable you to vote on different proposals. And so I can go and exchange Bitcoin for GTC tokens and then get more of a vote on every proposal, essentially, if I want to. And so their token, in essence, it is a governance token because it allows you to vote with it, but it also has a monetary value. That value goes up and down depending on market demand for that token. What are the activities of the organization of the DAO? What, whether people believe it's, it's good and it's going forward in a, in a meaningful way. So it's also in that sense, the fundraising token where if they, the, Git, the Gitcoin DAO holds a whole bunch of GTC tokens, and if the value of those goes up, they can convert that and pay salaries and do all these sorts of things um, with a different value wherever the GTC token is. So they, in that sense, have one token that operates both as a governance and as a, a sort of funding token. But as Shannon mentioned, like if you wanted to have a DAO where instead of being able to buy more votes, it's just a one person, one vote, then perhaps you would have one token when you prove your identity. So you would maybe connect that to say your proof of humanity identity, and that would allow you to vote. But maybe the, the DAO would have a different token that they use to raise funds or whatever. So from that standpoint, yeah, as Shannon says, it's really, you can structure it any way that you want to and have rules any way that you want to, the same way if you had a club or a community in the regular world, you could say, we're going to have only 100 people and no more, or we're going to have a million people and we're going to run our meetings like this, and we're going to do our dues like this and our votes like this. It's all kind of the same decisions you would make in a non-blockchain group of people trying to achieve a goal, but using blockchain mechanisms. That helps. Sure. When I think of NFT, I think of non-fungible, which to me is another word for a non-exchangeable token. If So does an NFT become an exchangeable token once it's on an exchange? How, what, what's the dynamics of that? How does that play? Into? Yeah, your, your thinking is right in that non-fungible means that those two things aren't the same, that a U.S. dollar is the same as any other U.S. dollar. We all think of it as having the same value. But once an NFT is on an exchange, it is still just uh, that specific one. It's not equal to any of the others. Can I sell my NFT and then buy a different one? I can, but it doesn't mean that they are equal to each other. It totally depends on the value of each one individually. And thank you, Extra Maya, for the resource that you put in the chat. That's a really good one. John, there's a resource in there that's an article about DAO tokenization. Thank you. I saw Extra Math also posted something about the Rohingya project. Do you want to hop on your mic and maybe tell everybody a bit more about that? Yeah. Hi, everybody. My name is Roy. Sorry, my Zoom handles off today, but just 
came in a little late and unfortunately I have to, to dip a little early, but it's a great conversation. And I just wanted to hop in because I'm very interested in this technology. I was involved in some DAOs last year and it's just an amazing new organizational form and thinking now about how to apply it to my day job at Extra Math, which is a not-for-profit that makes software used by kids to practice math. It's very simple. It's very small, very niche, but it's something that we know lots of, we have millions of students and parents and, and teachers who use it every month. And we don't nearly, haven't found a way to really capture the value of that community and think about other ways to serve it and to help serve itself <laughs> because we can't do everything. So that's a context that I'm thinking about now is how might we apply this at a broader scale. Open source development is an original distributed organization, <laughs> distributed decentralized organization. So we're thinking obviously about ways to tap into that, but other ways just of around delivering our program as well. That's really cool. And given that it's mathematics means that it, it can be a global audience that you're speaking to, which is interesting. And that's what all this crypto is at the end of the day. It's just math, right? If I have developed a feeling that math is in that case, not value neutral. Um, it's something that gives people freedom and agency and is really an essential for modern life. It's one of the UN sustainable development goals. It's very, it's broadly popular. It's just something that, you know, if you look at say the U S education system, not something that's very well organized, it's very fragmented. It's not very organized yet. It's highly centralized and and a lot of really entrenched power centers thinking about. Do you have thoughts about, given your DAO experience and what you're working on, have you thought about how those two worlds might be? Not in a real serious, deliberate way yet. No pressure. Those are, that, that would yeah. be a hard question to answer. It's just really interesting thinking about decentralized educational technologies, how we are sharing value with each other around the world in totally new ways. And to your point, the, the organization that Anne just mentioned, Gitcoin, like a lot of these um, conversations right now are happening around, like what is a public good? Like extra okay. math sounds like that kind of thing of this is something that everyone will benefit from. Having a global population that has math skills, everyone is made better for something like that. So how can we start thinking about incentivizing people who are creating them, who are sharing them, and who are making sure that this kind of thing is out in the world without it necessarily having to be that Somebody in a village in Uganda now has to pay a tuition for when, yeah, yeah on a global scale, we all benefit. Mm -hmm. So and there was a company. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, please continue. I was going to say there was a company that it, it started, didn't necessarily take off quite, but the concept was really interesting where the whole premise was there's all this free education available on YouTube, right? All just, you could learn anything you want. Anything you want. And so- how do you curate that into something meaningful? And so the idea was basically that for, say, Python classes or blockchain classes or something, a curator, so an individual who sort of steps up to the plate, finds all the right YouTube videos, creates a lesson of YouTube videos or a path that someone's got to follow, then writes a test at the end to help sell one to evaluate their learning skills. And then if they pass the test, they would get a certificate. And if somebody hired them, so a company would say, okay, we're happy to hire someone who's got this particular certificate, the kickback, there would be a kickback from the company mm -hmm. to the curator for the creating the content. And that would all happen like digital blockchain based certificates and then crypto based smart contracts would trigger that crypto payment back to the original curator of the content. New learning models and then learn to earn is, is a new model too, where they're actually paying people, yeah. microtransactions to watch different content about different blockchain companies. There's some cool stuff happening in, in around that space as well. Yeah. You reminded me that idea of quests, the rabbit hole .gg uses. And there's, I thought that was a really clever way of, again, tapping into the community knowledge to be able to provide that sort of a distributed way for people to create localized knowledge like Wikipedia. But right. Unfortunately, I've got to, to drop off, but I will, hopefully this will be a, a recurring call or group yeah we host office hours after all of our regularly scheduled events uh, usually a week later same time same channel we have an event uh, tomorrow night as well and we'll have office hours the following week just check out our events page or our slack channel um and you'll you'll get the updates 
Fantastic. Much appreciated. Yeah. Everybody appreciate you. Me. Appreciate you. Thanks joining for all us. the work you're doing. Thanks. Cool. It's so interesting to see the kind of people that come to these calls and the organizations that they're working with. There's such a breadth to the TechSoup audience. It's really awesome. You guys are doing interesting things. Yeah. I don't know if Caitlin if you guys are, are interested at all in, in contributing, but we were just tossing around ideas before you got here about some of the stuff that's happening around the world right now. And, and in the different headlines, um, a lot of us are U.S.-based, and unfortunately, we're seeing some not friendly things happening in the blockchain world there. And it is pushing more and more of these companies overseas. We've got some interesting times ahead of us, but, but yeah. Hi, Shannon. Thanks so much for sharing. I'm just... I'm tuning in. I'm with Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized Web, who's partnering with TechSoup. And I'm oh, thrilled cool. to have office hours because it's so cool to hear what folks are building and interested in learning about within the D-Web space. And I agree with you wholeheartedly that it's been a turbulent road this year. And I'm curious to hear what others' feelings are on decentralized technology and how they want to apply it in their day-to-day -day work. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you for the work that you're doing at Filecoin. You guys are awesome. Anna and I have both crossed paths with you guys a lot. And you're doing so much in the impact space right now. It's really exciting to see as you guys continue to, to expand out. But yeah, it, there's a lot going on in Asia right now because the U.S. is becoming increasingly unfriendly. Being European-based right now, it's not unfriendly. But it's getting harder to own crypto in the UK, given some of the laws that they just passed. France is doing some interesting things, both to incentivize more tech development and more entrepreneurship here, but then also making sure that they really have consumer protections in place, which make it a little bit of a double-edged area to operate. But we've got a big event coming up in Istanbul. There's going to be a lot of people from the Ethereum community gathering in November. And that's quite interesting. I just spent some time there talking to their local communities because they entered the, the decentralized space. They had their own stable co token for a while it's called B Lira, pegged to their local currency so people could start playing online and engaging in different ways there. And the government came in after a couple of years and criminalized any sort of cryptocurrency transaction in commerce. So it's not illegal to own crypto. You can still buy it as an investment. And in a lot of ways, people are, there's a lot of speculation there, but you are not allowed to use any sort of cryptocurrency in commercial exchange. So I can't buy a t-shirt with Bitcoin or with Elira or any of those. So it's created an interesting space for like their college students to operate in right now. And that a lot of them are super interested. They want to learn programming around it. And everyone's just in the space of like, we hope in the next administration it will change. So it's like a timeout, but not a firm stop. Governments around the world are putting us all in these kind of liminal, like liminal spaces of, are we going to be okay? Are we not? Do we continue forward? Or we, do we really put the brakes on things? Yeah. And I would add to that, this technology and these innovations are going to happen. The question is where, which countries are going to benefit from the taxation of those companies, the great people that these companies bring in. Um, and if you look at the United States, it's really, it's driving people away. I know a lot of people that have left, um, companies are leaving, they're, they're actively choosing to set up in the United States for those reasons. And it's the uncertainty and the fear with some of this, where if you're doing something that's that forward thinking, that's breaking down so many traditional power structures, that it, it could be more than just losing your business. It could be jail time. It could be other things that are, are much more serious. So, yeah, I think it's, it's very much to the United States detriment that, that they're getting on board and, and really driving some of this innovation forward. But thanks for everything with Filecoin. Yeah, I absolutely love your organization and everything you're doing. So we're super stoked to be working with you. Hopefully I'll see y'all in Istanbul. I think that we'll be there for Lab Week with Protocol Labs. And I think there will be a network base for Filecoin Foundation as well. Very cool. Yeah, it'll be a pleasure to meet in person. Yeah, and I, I agree. We just had a, with another one of our project partners, Blockchain Law for Social Good Center at University of San Francisco. We have an international affiliated scholars program. And so there's three 
different scholars based in different regions. And it's going to be really interesting to hear how they're applying blockchain use cases in their local region and how it's interplaying with policy and government um, offices. If you're interested in seeing what different what the climate is in different regions and, and attitudes towards blockchain, I'm happy to connect you with uh, folks over there as well. Amazing. Yeah, that's super interesting. Yeah, and if I may, Shannon, what I understand, coming, I come from a, this is John again, I come from a background of finance. And what mm-hmm. I understand when it has to do with NFTs domestically in the U.S., it has to do with whether we treat them as a security or not. And my understanding that Bitcoin is pretty much, that's been settled. The question being whether it's a uh, commodity or it's a security. And I understand Bitcoin and Ether are on pretty safe ground there. Uh, The question lies in as to how regulatory wise they're going to treat NFTs and the umpteen thousands of other MFT, NFTs out there has whether it's deemed a security or not. When something's deemed as a security and it's being traded, a whole host of issues come up as to disclosure, mm-hmm. uh, financial disclosure of the issuer in this case of the securities. And that's where all the, the problems lie. Um, not to defend the U.S., but the U.S. has always been very, had a strong financial market, largely due to the level of disclosure and, and their disclosure laws are pretty strict when it comes to the Security and Exchange Commission. However, that all goes, we shall see. And, uh, but those are, I just wanted to add that dimension to it. I can't speak to HIPAA and all those things, but that's what I do know about securities who at least the securities laws are concerned in the U.S. Yeah, and it's a tricky conversation on a weekly basis right now. We thought that Ethereum was pretty safe and that's starting to look like it might not be the case. Depends. There's a lot of concern about the switch to proof of state and where more of the nodes are located. There's all sorts of things. And unfortunately, in a lot of cases, and the, the U.S. takes the cake for this, but there's a lot of ways in which they keep the laws intentionally obscure so that they can decide what's within and what's without. It would be wonderful if they just came right out and said, here is a very black and white delineation of what's okay and what's not. And they're doing it in uh, like a lot of the banking investigators and the former state prosecutors that I've been speaking to about this say that that's left in place on purpose so that they've got a little bit of wiggle room. To Anne's point, it really is not if, but now starting to be increasingly where there's places like Estonia and Malta that are very keen on setting themselves up as being a friendlier environment. And it's a, it's hard to watch other places like the U.S. start to have people offshore and we're going to get left behind in some ways because we're just making it too hard to, to function there. The other piece is with the admin of DAOs, you don't actually need a jurisdiction, but you can operate with people and employees all over the world. There's no official company. There's no shares. It's not owned by anything. There's nothing there. And that's going to become increasingly prevalent. I know uh, Shapeshift DAO, they converted from a traditional U.S. corporation into a full DAO. They're again, not registered anywhere. Uh, and so that brings us into, into consideration things like what human rights law do they follow? What human resources law do they follow? If you want a maternity leave, what are people entitled to based on, is it based on where they live? Is it based on their citizenship? Is it just something that the group decides? And then if something goes wrong, who do you sue? How do you sue a DAO that doesn't have a jurisdiction? How do you get recourse? So there's going to be some big questions that I think we haven't tackled yet. And then I know in the chat, I think Nick had posted some about NFTs and how do you classify them? And some of the challenges with these tokens is that it's classified and asking someone to put a stamp on an email. It just doesn't really fit with the systems that we necessarily have today. So if you look at an NFT, as Shana mentioned, all it means is that one token is not equal to a, to a similar token. They're different things. But an NFT can be a, a commodity, like a, it could be like, or, or Nick, as he was saying, like a consumer product, like an art piece. 
It can also be a fraction of a house, which would look a lot more like maybe a security. It could be a fraction of a company, which would definitely look like a security. It could be a, a digital identity, which like, how do you qualify that? I'm trying to get one label across something that really is more of a function rather than a one, one group of a thing um, is so challenging. And that's where I think governments are trying to use the old systems that they have to put all these new things into the boxes they're comfortable with. And the reality is we might just need new boxes or maybe no boxes. So that's where things get a little bit more complicated. But Nick, I don't know, do you want to jump in and maybe tell us more about what you're thinking there? I used to run exchange. We used to have to list, we didn't have to, but like we listed tokens. And back in the days, especially 2017, there were a lot of ICO tokens that sort of got into the STO area. And I think at the time, what we wanted to do is referencing in, in the financial market, they use how we test, H-O-W-E-Y. That's you pretty much ask yourself four questions. And then you decide whether that is a security or not from there. And a lot of that has to do with whether this is a profitable thing or not, based off speculation, price price speculation. And I think that I think that is still very effective. Usually, you just have to ask yourself that, and then you can pretty much the answer will fall out. Thanks. This is great, guys. No need to. Draw it out if we've started to answer your questions and wrap things up. But John, thank you so much for coming with all of the curiosity. That was awesome. And really interesting to start kicking ideas around there. And Nick, having run an exchange, you've got really interesting experience there, especially if you were doing it back in 2017. I'm sure you saw all sorts of things. So thanks for joining us, guys. If we have any other questions, totally happy to hang out and answer them. What do you think, Billy? How are we doing? I think closing, if no one has any other questions or comments, is the right thing to do. We'll let you get back to your mornings or whatever time in the day it is. And uh, thank, thanking uh, Shannon and Anne for joining us. And thank you all for your questions and engagement. For anyone who can't get enough of this good stuff, we host uh, webinars every week. And we also have a Slack channel that you can jump into. Eli just pinged the chat with our Slack channel. So if you want to keep the conversation going, jump into the Slack and we welcome your questions and conversations then. So thanks everyone. Thanks, Shannon. Thanks, Anne.